That's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, I read that, and we all know what the Bible says, and maybe, we, maybe you didn't know that he was nine feet tall. Maybe you didn't know his, his armor weighed 125 pounds. Maybe you didn't know the tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds. But now you do. And so if you understand the dynamics of what was going on, the, these armies are on one hill. You have the Philistines on one side, the Israelites on the other, and they're facing each other. And instead of coming down and fighting each other in the valley, they send out this one guy who's really big. I mean, they're Ringer. They're sending out their, their, their Shaquille O'Neal. They're Michael Jordan. They're sending out their, their most powerful guy, and they're, he's challenging them. He's challenging them. He's like, you want to fight? Come fight me. Come fight me. And they're scared. Because it's a huge wall. It's a huge obstacle. It's a huge giant. I mean, in the least, this guy is powerful, and he's a champion, and no one is even dared to challenge him back to defeat him. And so... Therefore, they're living in this struggle with this giant in their lives. And that's a message that we all know. That's the message that we all have heard. But I say that because sometimes when we look at our life, and we know this part too, that we face giants. That we face some, some things in our lives that are big and they're huge. And sometimes we want to hide and we want to shy away from those responsibilities. And, and, and this morning, I hope the challenge is there that you would not just shy away from that responsibility, but that you would rise to it. That you would rise to that responsibility, whatever it may be. We're going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. And so the story goes on that uh, Jesse, on that, during the same time, Jesse was talking to his son David. And Jesse had eight sons. And so three of which were in the army, and they were already in the army of Saul. And so Jesse made the, he roasted some grain. So he kind of probably roasted some pinon and sent it with uh, David to give to his sons. And then he made some bread. It probably wasn't just regular bread. It was probably pan dulce. I'm just going to throw that out there. And uh, if you don't know what pan dulce is, it's Mexican sweet bread. It's really good. Um, and he sent it to his son. But it was more than just about bread and grain and giving food to his sons. It says that he also sent cheese to, to the captain of, 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 of their sons. And he was just taking care of them. But it was more about food, and more, more than just about food. It was about the level of care. Were you, are you doing okay? And so they sent David, and David's going, and so as he's getting there, um, he, he finally meets up with them. And it says this. As soon as, the, so as soon as he gets there, David's kind of this lucky guy. And this is how we know it's orchestrated by God, because as he's getting there, the Israelites are getting ready to go back to the top of the hill and face the Philistines and just get ready for battle again. And if any other day is like yesterday, they're not going to fight. They're just going to stay there, face each other off, and then when they're tired, they're going to go sit down. It says, as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you ever seen the giant still talking about Goliath? The man asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will a man get for killing the Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. And so he's having this conversation and he's like, so, so, so wait a minute. So, so if, if someone, not me, maybe a person were to go out into, the, into this valley, face this guy, kill him, they would, they would get what again? Like the king's daughter? And his whole family is, ex okay, let me, if I, let me hear you right. You, you said we're all exempt from taxes. I mean, most of us would jump at the chomp at the bits just to jump at that option today. I mean, some of us, and, and, you know, some of us know a person, not us, have cheated you know, on the IRS, and maybe misreport it so we pay a little bit taxes, a little bit less taxes. But nonetheless, that's the reward. So he's getting a wife, he's getting free tax, tax free and tax exempt for the rest of his life. And he's saying, so, so what again? And it's the same reply. Yeah, you, you're gonna, you, you get a wife and you get no taxes for the rest of your life. And then it says this, that then, in verse 31, then David's question was reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. That kind of leads me to believe that David was like, well, pff, why don't you just guys go out and fight him? I mean, if, I will. I will. You guys scared? You scared? I'll go. I'm not scared. I'll go. You want me to go? I'll go. 
And so then they're like, what is it? who is this guy? We, we better tell the king this guy's talking like this because, you know what, we've been sitting out here for weeks and months and, and we're, we're fearful of this guy. And we're gonna, if this guy's ready to go, let's tell the king so he can go. And so they go to the king and they report to the king. And this is where it comes up again. It says, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. And so David's like saying, okay, and this is finally makes a de- declaration. I will go fight him. I'll do it for you. You guys all sitting back? I'm not going to sit back any longer. I've been here for 10 minutes, and that's been long enough. I'm going to go. I'm going to fight. And David was the youngest of these eight boys, uh, mind you. And then it says, um, don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You are only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been, t- I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. Uh, when the lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns to me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have, uh, I have done this both. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll go do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God, the Lord who rescued um, me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And so then you, you're reading this, and there seems to be this no negotiation. You can't fight him. Yes, I can. I fought a bear. I fought a lion. In other versions, it says that David uh, killed, the, killed the bear with his bare hands. He had bare hands of his own. Um. <laughs> but Saul finally allows him. He finally succumbs to this negotiation and these tactics of David. And, and, and it says this as, it, as the story goes on. It says, Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. So just, just armor that David was walking around with. David put on, strapped a sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like. For he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I am not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from the stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with a shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. And we know the rest of the story. Some of you might be saying, because I'm not going to read the rest of the story. What? 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 I mean, you're just getting to the good part. I mean, he's, he's going to go out, he's going to fight him. He's going to go out and cut off his head. He's going to go out and he's going to slingshot him from a long distance away. We all know that part of the story. And as important as that is, as inspiring as that is, that's not the important part of the story this morning. The important part of the story is what Saul experienced through the course of what's going on here. And what happened was this. So what about Saul? What is it about Saul that is important a part of this message? Paul was a Benjamin. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Benjamite. There's something very unique about the tribe of, Benj- of, of Benjamin, and it's recorded in different scriptures, and we're going to read those in a second. But or let's just read 20, Judges 20:16. Among Benjamin's elite troops, 700 were left-handed, and each of them could sling a rock and hit a target within a hair's breadth without missing. A slingshot. They could sling rocks and they can sling them. Some, some uh, historians in some books, in the book of Jewish legends, says that they could, hit up, they could hit a camel's hair from up to 500 feet away with a rock and a slingshot. Armed with just a rock and a slingshot. In, 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 in another book, in Chron- 1 Chronicles 12.2, 12, it says, All of them were expert archers, and they could shoot arrows or sling stones with their left hands as well as their right. They were all relatives of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin was known for being masters. The tribe of Benjamin was known for being experts with the slingshot. Is anybody kind of feeling me where I'm going with this? He was an expert with the tool that killed the giant that set the people free. 
And all the while he's facing this giant, he's wondering, how am I going to fight? He's hiding behind the army of his people. He's hiding behind and cowering behind, and he's not looking ahead. He's not looking at what he can do. He's looking for the next person that's going to be brave enough to step forward, all, with, all the while with the tool that he needed to slay the giant at his hip. At his hip. And it took a little shepherd boy, unassuming and frail, without armor, without a helmet, without a sword, armed only with a slingshot and a staff. Skills that he had, skills that he knew. It said that when the animal would turn on him, he grabbed by the jaw and he clubbed it. He didn't club it with a stick, he clubbed it with the shepherd's staff. It was tools that were at his hip. It was tools that he had mastered. It was tools that he had known and that he had come accustomed to. And he used the tools that were a part of his life. And Saul was sitting back saying, which one? Which one of you guys? And you know what? It's so valuable to me. I'll give you one of my daughters. I'll give you tax exemption for the rest of your life, not just for you and your family. And that wasn't enough to entice anyone to step out onto the battlefield and fight the giant. Back to the skill sets. First of all is this. I wrote this this morning. You can't send indigenous people into battle with foreign weapons. We are, and I say indigenous, we're all indigenous to the area. We're all indigenous to the church. And we're all indigenous to this building. And we're all indigenous to the teachings or the leadership of Pastor Paul. And we all have different skill sets and weapons as we sit here. We all have things that we're good at. We all have things that we, that we desire to do. I mean, you see some of the big things like musician or people who are good with media or creation or ideation. And you don't necessarily see people who have attention to detail that clean the church, but we appreciate a clean church when we come into it. But all of those things come together and they formulate this, this team. They formulate this population of people who are ready and willing with different skill sets to advance the kingdom. I mean, it talks about swords, it talks about shields, but it never talks about the blacksmith who made the sword, the blacksmith who made the shield. And sometimes they're forgotten. Sometimes they're forgotten. But without his individual skill set, this ball couldn't perpetuate forward. And so us as the church, us as individuals in this, in, the, in this, this, I say this arena, but this sanctuary, we have to teach people how to use their individual skill sets. We have to raise people to, to find their skill set. Well, you know, I don't have any skills. <laughs> Napoleon Dynamite, you ever seen the movie? No? Okay, sorry. I went on a tangent again. I have ninja skills. You all have skills. We all have skills that we can use and that we can, that we can put forward. See, I lost my spot because I didn't, I didn't, went on my tangent here. That we can use. I think the Japanese are the perfect is an example of this. When you think about some of the weapons that they have, all, most of the weapons that are famous for us, you know, they were originally designed as farm tools. Farm tools. And so one, they were disguised, and two, they were unassuming but they were originally designed as farm tools. But as you look around and you say, you know what, I wish I had his skill. Sometimes that transfers and translates into different language like, man, if I had his money, I could have that skill. I mean, if you look at my life, people say all the time, if I had a wife as gorgeous as yours and kids as well-behaved and good-looking as yours, I could have a perfect life like you too. That was supposed to be funny. It's okay to laugh. <laughs> Most people laugh when I tell about how I married up and my wife married down. Oh, see, there it is. But we, we all have skills. 
We all have skills that we can develop. We all have skills. But the problem is that we look to the person on our left and to our right, and we think that their skill is better based on the smile on their face on a Sunday morning. We think that their skills and their life is going better because the amount of dollars that they have in their bank account. We think that their skills are better because they're up here and they're, they're used and they're asked and they're chosen to be on stage to speak or to play the guitar. And you might have the ability to speak and play the guitar or do something, but you have to find a way to jump in and get in the game. And sometimes that's not going to be, you know, you in the draft pick and looking, people looking down and, oh, yeah, that guy, uh, he, he looks like he has skills. No, sometimes you have to sell yourself. Like David said, you know, I can do it. I've been here 10 minutes and you guys have been here for weeks and you guys are scared of that. Let me go out there. Put me in, coach. Put me in to fight. Put me in to, to win this battle. And sometimes it's the hardest thing to do. Because sometimes we're taught in the church to be humble and practice humility. Well, that's not very humble. You're asking the pastor if you can speak. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Maybe God's given you a message in your heart. But maybe sometimes it's not in the plan either. And maybe that plan is for the youth group. Maybe that message is for a devotion. Maybe that, that, that message, the, the, the get, that calling you have, or the skills that you want to express are designed for a men's meeting or a small group and allowing yourself to practice those there. I'm not talking about simple skills, okay, in life. We're going to jump for a second. I'm talking, to, you know, I'm not talking about simple skills. I like to run. I know it doesn't quite show, okay, but if you saw me a few years ago, before you laugh and before you start casting your judgment on me, okay, I weigh a whopping 210 pounds, I gained some weight back, I've been in the slump going to get back in the game. But I used to weigh 260 pounds, okay? Now, you know, well, that's not that much. Listen, go to the grocery store, get 60 pounds, 61 pound things of burger and put it on your body. That's a lot of weight, okay? But I like to run. And so, like, for me, I, you know, where I kind of see this skill or where this kind of this creeping up and me wanting other people's skills is this. I mean, I run my butt off. Like, I get on treadmill, I'm like, oh, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it today, I'm going to beat that eight-minute eight, eight mile, I'm going to get in the seven-minute range, and I'm running, and I'm starting to t- feel the taste of blood in my mouth, and my ribs are starting to hurt because, you know, I just had a burrito for breakfast, and it's starting to attack me in the morning. And I'm like, I shouldn't have had that. I shouldn't have had that soda. I'm starting to burp, and I'm running like heck, and I get like eight minutes and 45 seconds. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> See, you guys are all holding it back. And I, talk, I got friends, and I got a friend, and, and this is the person that comes to mind, and she can run a six-minute mile for 26 miles in a marathon. I'm like, I hate you. I hate you. I want, I want that skill, but I have to develop my skill. I mean, Pastor Paul, I mean, he likes to choke people. It's just, let's just break it down. He says, I like to compete. No, he likes to choke people, Okay. Don't wrestle Pastor Paul, he's going to choke you, and he might laugh ab- about it afterwards. Or maybe, like he did to that guy, and the, the, the big tall guy, he talked about him on, from the pulpit. I, gave, I took his neck and I gave it back to him. No, but you know what, if I, were, if I were you, no, listen. If I were you, though, I would put, and yes, I'm a pastor. Just, a little, just that extra badge of honor, like on your gi or something. Are you really a pastor? Yeah, you got choked out by a pastor, bro. Imagine what that could do for the church. Imagine what that could do for people wanting to believe in God. I'm talking about skills needed to slay the specific individual giants in your life. The specific skills that we bring together to destroy the giants that exist within this community and surrounding, I'm going to say junction community, not going to say community, but I, the surrounding community and in this city. There's giants of homelessness. There's giants of, 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 of poverty. There's giants of, of just everything that you can think of. 
And so if you were to say, you know, this is just another story about good versus evil. This is just another story about David slaying the, the slaying Goliath. If that's what you take from it, and that's what inspires you, and that's what gets you to push, push on, to get up in the morning, read your Bible, and take that to school, take that to work, take that to your family gathering, take that to the, to the birthday party. If that's what you take, then take it. But the real part of this message is more th- about more than just about good versus evil, but about the tool set that you have on your hip, the tool set that Saul had on his hip, the tool set that Paul had to slay the giant and decided not to. And although it was a victory for his kingdom, it was a failure in his leadership. And so your victories and your testimonies and your stories about how God being ever present in your life, as we tell those stories, those victories don't come without setbacks, without struggle, without trial, or without pain. And so there, I say, you can't shrink from the responsibility of struggle or trial or pain, but you have to rise to it. You have to rise to it. And you can read scriptures throughout the Bible that talk about that, about no weapon ever being formed against you. But if there is, that God is giving you the right tool set to battle it. And that pray, praying it out of your life is not the answer. Oh, well, well, I would believe if I ever seen a miracle. I would believe if God has ever worked in my life. I don't, work in, I don't see God working in my life. You know how, let me just say this. You know how selfish we are as Christians? I'm going to get down here to say this. I hope I'm not messing anything up up there. This is how selfish we are. That we'll pray and we'll plead and we'll ask and we'll cry and we'll weep at the altar for God to do this specific miracle in our lives. Because it applies and pertains to us. But we forget and ignore that we trust in Him for the greatest miracles in all the world to, be, to happen on a daily basis. How many of you have ever gone to bed at night and said, God, please, would you allow the sun to come up tomorrow? Yesterday, you didn't allow it to come up? No, we expect him to do that. We expect him to continue rotating the earth on its axis at just the right amount of speed so it doesn't stop and we fling off into space or that it spins so fast and the same result, or that when it stops, goes so slow that we slam into the earth. And that it doesn't speed up so fast that we just get flung off the earth. And we trust Him for that and we plead and we say, God, I don't see a miracle. You're not healing me of my cold or my flu. I can't go to work. Sometimes you have to go through the cold or the flu in your life. For the, in the very least, to build toughness. Emotional stamina. Being, a, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. This is what I've learned as a pastor. I'm on this upswing. I was kind of in this slump for a long time. And, and let me just cut the, short, the story short. One day I got a call and said, hey, in about seven months, you have a balloon payment due. Your church has a balloon payment due. Okay, well, I hope it's about $500 because that's what you have in the account. And she says, well, it's, it's $126,000. Excuse me? I, th- I think you got the wrong number because we don't have that kind of debt at my church. And I remember going through that for the next 18 or so months of my life. I began to struggle with anxiety. I began to struggle with different things. And every day I had to wake up and go to work. I work at a middle school, counseling middle school kids. Every day I had to go, or every Sunday I had to, to, to go to church. Every week I had to prepare a message. Life didn't let up. And even if I wanted to run away from it, and even if I did run away from it, guess what? Still there. I can't wait for somebody to come fight for me. I shouldn't. And if you do, it doesn't create what God designed it to be. I've learned a couple things. God's not inattentive to me. John was Jesus' cousin. Do you know, he didn't ignore him. And even though it kind of seemed like it at the end of his life, he didn't ignore him. Something great happened from that. 
Paul pleaded all the time. It's like, God, will you just take this thorn from my side? Will you take this? I mean, I'm not asking you for anything more than you've done in, other, in someone else's life. I've prayed some of this stuff out of somebody else's life. I've done it. You've done it through me, and I've seen you do it. No, you know what? That, that miracle's not for you, Paul. My grace, though, that's sufficient for you. Wait, what, what? You're not cooperating with me, God. You're not cooperating with my situation. You're supposed to be healing me of these things. I'm healing other people, and you're healing other people through me. You should be healing me. My grace is more than sufficient for you. Or maybe, maybe, you're like Lazarus, and maybe Mary and Martha. His disciples, he said, you know what? You need to you gotta go, you gotta go. here on time. God, if you would have given me my... My, my, my check on time, if I would have had the money on time, I could have paid this bill. God, you're too late. You're too late. We've already experienced all this. There's no turning back from what I've gone through. You, you're too late. And we know at the end of the story that Jesus wasn't too late. Jesus wasn't too late. I've learned God doesn't ignore me. He's not being uncooperative with my life and my ministry. And he's never too late because today is that free. And in fact, in fact, there's money in the bank account. It's more than five five hundred dollars. And God is always there to protect and to provide and to just guide us through and navigate. He said he'll take you through the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't say that he'll abandon you there. The things that he will never leave or forsake you. But sometimes you have to be subject, subject to the full situation that God has presented for you. And sometimes that failure and that struggle is necessary for the victory and what it looks like at the end. Every week at the end of our uh, of our of our message, we have handles that we. We like to communicate. I think here we should call it our takeaway. And these are the three takeaways. One, your victories, they sometimes, I didn't put sometimes, but they won't come easy. Sometimes you're going to struggle. And that's okay. Find a place in your life where you're comfortable with being uncomfortable in the huge arena we call life. Don't shrink from responsibility. Rise to it. If you didn't catch on, that's in in JFK's speech at his inauguration. It was just before he says, he says, we're not going to shrink from this responsibility, but we're going to rise to it. Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask your country what you can do for it. Don't ask what your church can do for you. Ask what you can do for your church. Don't shrink from responsibility. Rise to it. You have the right tools for the job. And I'm, I have a lot of tools. I have a lot of stuff. And I have the right tool for just about every job on a car. The only thing I can't do is like lift an engine with, with a crane. But I can, I can do that with my bare hands. So I don't need that. But you this morning, in your situation, in your struggle, your finances, your marriage, you have the right tool for the job. You don't need somebody else's money. You don't need good-looking kids like mine. You don't need to run a seven-minute mile. You don't need to be able to choke somebody out and laugh at it and call yourself a Christian. You have the right tool for the job. You got it your own. Now it's time to go through your own. Will you go ahead and stand with me this morning? Lord, we come before you. Lord, you, there's no way we could hallow your name here in an individual play, prayer. There's no way we could hallow you with, with our lives. But God, you give us opportunities every day to do so. You give us opportunities to use the skill set that you've given us and that we've developed over years. And you allow us to, to, to intersect our, our relationship with you with the things that we love, God. And you, are, you allow us to call that ministry. 
God, continue to grow us. Continue to give us courage to rise to those responsibilities. We know we're not going to be we're not going to make it through sometimes in peace and it might be a struggle. But God, you give given us the tools to slay the giants in our life. We have the right tool for the job. And before we pray anything out of our lives, we thank you for that. For the struggle and for the skill set you've given us in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Just right where you're at, before we transition and close out of this place, here's what I would ask you to just pray in your own words. God, what tool have you given me? And where do I need to use that tool? Father, you've given us, every one of us in this place, you've given us unique tools. You've given us unique giftings. You've given us a unique set of talents, time, and treasure. And God, you've asked us to, to be those kind of people like David that step up and say, here I am. And Father, I thank you that there's a team here at Junction Community Church that we celebrate every Sunday, every week team that we call our dream team, Lord. And I thank you for everyone that steps up and says, here's my tool. For our prayer right now, God, is for every one of us, Lord, that we would pray, what's my tool and how can I be used? Now with every eye closed, I'll tell you what, God has gifts and talents he's put in your life. Abilities. He's done things in your life, but here's Here's, here's what I believe with all of my heart. Before you can truly operate in using those tools that God has given you, you first have to surrender your life to Him. So all over this place, with every eye closed, if you're saying, look, today I want to give my life to Christ, or you're saying, look, I want to surrender my life to Him, or you're saying, I need to recommit my life to Him. If you're watching online and you're saying, that's me today, I need to recommit. Would you just raise your hand right now all over this place if that's you. God sees your hands. God sees your hands. God sees your hands. If you say, that's me, would you just lift your hand real high and put it right back down? God sees your hand. God sees your hand. Online, if that's you, just let your host know, that's me today. Right there in the chat, be bold enough to say, that's me today. I'm committing to that. So with that being said, I'm going to ask for everyone here that raised your hand and everyone else in this place, would you just repeat a simple prayer after me? Would you just say, Jesus, today I surrender my life. Thank you for the tools. Thank you for the gifts. Thank you for the abilities. And from this day forward, I want to use them for your purpose in my life. Save me. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can we just thank God for those that are responding today?